Thank you for the nice introduction, Bill, and thank you all, of course, for being here. I did ask Bill whether or not we could have class outside, and he said no. <laughs> we have to be in, but it is a, a, a lovely room and a lovely day, so once again. And so the subject first and foremost for me is, uh, uh, as Bill said, near and dear to my heart. I've been spending a fair amount of my life and time working on site preservation efforts in uh, a variety of different capacities, as Bill mentioned, for different agencies and at different university settings, and now very happily at Archaeology Southwest. But most of my professional career spent in and around this area, the White Mountain Apache tribes, lands uh, straight north of Tucson and straight north of the San Carlos Apache tribes lands. And what I first wanted to do is just show you that map so that you're oriented that way, and then also give you the main argument that I'm gonna be presenting because sometimes I drift around and especially without notes, who knows exactly where we're going to end up. So um, looting and grave robbing, I don't mean to get things a little bit more sober, but they persist as major threats to sites and site preservation, something that people have sort of drifted away from thinking about very much. That tribal communities are disproportionately impacted by these crimes against archeological resources for reasons I'll go into. Um, and at the same time, however, those disadvantages or disproportional effects turn out to at least in some ways be ways for tribes to be able to harness their experience uh, on the impacted side and be able to turn those adverse effects into tools for dealing with looting, curbing it in new and different ways. And then last and, oh, last and not least there is that um, we are now working through a, the beginning stages of what we hope will be a long and fruitful partnership, first with the White Mountain Apache tribe, seeing how it works to develop a more, should we say, community-based and um, community-driven and diverse program of dealing with looting activities and trying to find better ways to prevent investigate and prosecute those activities. And then if it works and we feel successful and the tribe feels successful, then we'll move on and consider working with other tribes and communities as well. So that's the kernel of what I'm going to say. If I get too far away from any of those things, somebody stop me. Uh, but I did want to just bring it all back around also to where I am now sitting, which is as the manager of the program for site and landscape preservation at Archaeology Southwest. Been doing this work for about a year. Um, and it's not um, just because I wanted to check off another box, Bill. It's just also just a little bit of a case of employment attention deficit disorder. Um, I stick with jobs on an order of about 13, job, 13 years each, and then somehow I lose, lose track and, and, um, and drift a little bit. And it's trying to look for something different. Uh, in any case, this is the core of what happens at Archaeology Southwest, preservation archaeology with this beautiful cyclical blend between research, site protection, and outreach and public engagement. And so grounded in uh, two ethical principles, the top two bullet points there, and then I've just gone ahead and added liberally a third, that tribal values merit special consideration and action. Um, uh, these days on the part of professional archaeologists, especially working in the context that we work in. And this means, um, first and foremost, listening. And this photograph, I really like the Archaeology Southwest whole overlapping three-part um, graphic. And I also like this photograph because it's one of the few where I'm working but with my mouth closed. Uh, and so gives me an opportunity, uh, especially in the presence of gentlemen like these, Hopi, excuse me, Zuni um, officials to learn a lot about their views of the past and their relationships to archeology. span So um, my job entails these four things land acquisition and conservation easements, priority preservation lands, advocacy, and uh, preservation, site preservation. The, those are the four components of our site and landscape preservation program. And uh, the first, in some ways, core one is land acquisition and conservation easements. And I'm sort of happy to say that this map is now outdated because of good work on the part of the organization and many of you all 
in order to make it possible for us to acquire two new properties, the, the Texas Hill property and the Gully Parcel, uh, brand new ones, both in the Gila Bend area. Thank you very much to the Smith Family Foundation for that. And again, to many of you all also for helping with those acquisitions in 2016 and 2017. So that brings us up to, I think by my count, about 10 conservation easements and nine properties held in fee simple. And so that's an impressive portfolio and an important one for, for me to, to keep track of. And here's one of our main stars there, the Ronquillo Preserve in the ball court there on the San Pedro. Many of you familiar with that place and that photograph, of course. In addition to the actual dealing with real estate, there's the advanced planning that goes on in the, the, the program that I help run. And that involves taking care of and thinking ahead to priority preservation lands, the places and clusters of archaeological sites that constitute landscapes and that deserve special attention because of their connections between the sites and the ways that they come together and divine very special places and districts worthy of special attention in planning government activities, roads, um, you know, whatever else might be going on, community development, etc. And so we use that information in, you know, the third most important part of our site and landscape preservation effort, which of course is the advocacy, a part of the portfolio that's grown in the last few years for, for, for many reasons, um, but especially because of growing capacity and recognition of the, the fundamental truth that if we don't take care of things now and make sure that they're around for the future, then, um, then who else is gonna do it? So just a quick note on what it is that we're doing site preservation for. Uh, um, uh, what are, the reasons why we need to do site preservation. And so the first being that the world is changing um, in front of our eyes and we need to be attentive to those things. An advanced shot from, or fire across, firing across, the shot across the bow from the big floods in 1993 that, that, that scoured through terraces on the Gila River that hadn't been scoured for a long, long time. Um, we're seeing more and more of these extreme weather events, of course. There's also the aforementioned economic development, and especially resource extraction activities that deserve attention by way of site protection um, and preservation, community development and uh, infrastructure that are also sources of site degradation. I chose the, the photo in the, the upper corner there of Honda subdivision because it's on White Mountain Apache tribe lands and because it shows community development and in a certain sense, um, shows the result of land modification due to a changing climate and changing world because of all the intensive thinning that they've had to do there, uh, especially in the wake of the big rodeo Cheddar Sky Fire that came through in, in 2001. Didn't get there in part because of lots and lots of forest thinning, but all of these things, of course, have potential to adversely affect archaeological sites and resources and landscapes, and so we're attentive to those things. And then this last one is the one that we're just now starting to engage with in a deliberate and more systematic way at Archaeology Southwest, and that's this looting and unregulated collecting issue that has been damaging sites for a long, long time. It's an old and shifty problem. Um, I think some of you know about old and shifty problems. Uh, and um, one that's been around at least since folks in my home state of Colorado took exception to Gustav Nordenskjold uh, and his collecting activities in the Mesa Verde area. And uh, we're especially concerned to know that the artifacts that he was collecting were being shipped to the National Museum of Sweden. And so they rallied around the troops, oops, rallied around the troops and um, got the Antiquities Act eventually passed. It started the dynamics that eventually led to the passage of the Antiquities Act. Um, and uh, Gustav did not live long enough. He was another uh, tuberculosis uh, sufferer who came to Colorado the way that my family actually came to Colorado from Missouri because of, a, of a, the eldest aunt in, in my family was uh, tubercular. And so um, he came there and was uh, summarily excluded from the place because he was a foreigner and a non-native um, from native Coloradans who were very concerned about that. That irony, however, was not lost on Colorado's Native American people, that there was <laughs> this uh, rally around to try to get Gustav Nordenskold out of the, out of the territory. Um, but um, <clears throat> no special rights or privileges of being accorded at that time. And as a matter of fact, Colorado was one of the states that was most opposed and was actually successful briefly from excluding all native people and lands from its, uh, 
uh, its territory. Anyway, the irony uh, was not lost, as I said. I, those dynamics, though, did set in place the first major piece of federal cultural resource management protection legislation, the Antiquities Act of 1906, um, which made it a crime to collect without a permit, to excavate on public federal Indian lands or public or federal Indian lands uh, without a permit and without an agreement to curate the materials that you collected and reposit them in a public place where other archaeologists could find them and, and use them in their research. Um, it all Teddy took care of that. And then it also included these other very important provisions allowing for presidential authority to set aside national monuments. And he used that to great effect, um, himself setting aside 18. Every other president, including number 25, has taken advantage of that provision of the um, Antiquities Act. But um, the provisions for criminal penalties associated with the Antiquities Act did not stand the test of time. And in fact, in 1974, were struck down because of a case from Arizona's Indian lands. Um, a collector, uh-oh, Ben, I think, Diaz, um, apprehended as a result of possessing materials from the San Carlos Indian Reservation, gone dancer materials. They brought him up on Antiquities Act charges for failing to get a permit, and the act was found to be unconstitutionally vague. And so from 1974 onward, there was no protection on federal or Indian lands against looters or unpermitted collectors. You could go after people for theft of government property or for uh, theft of tribal property, but no federal legislation unifying those things. So it was left for another generation of, of leaders, uh, political as well as archeological, people like Raymond H. Thompson and Don Fowler and Bill Leip, who is sort of our, uh, should we say, pater familia of, of uh, preservation archeology, span um, led the charge to establish a federal law that would prevent and enable prevention and prosecution of archeological resource crimes. And this time, they made sure that it was a better law than the Antiquities Act provisions were going to be and made it so that there were felony provisions, as a matter of fact, for any collecting or damaging of archaeological resources, anything more than 100 years old, as a matter of fact. Um, and uh, public and uh, Indian lands were equally protected. Um, people in the federal workforce law enforcement, as well as archeologists, saw this as a great tool and believed at the time and for many years after that this was going to put an end to unauthorized collecting and digging and, and damaged archeological sites on federal and Indian land. Um, uh, prosecutors lined up for cases, uh, every Archaeologists in the federal works art force took ARPA classes. People flocked to classrooms and, and seminar rooms and into field seminars to learn the techniques for doing damage assessments. It was unique in the world of law enforcement, not just within the United States, but across the planet in obliging collaboration directly between professional archaeologists and um, law enforcement agents to work on the looting crime. And so it was by, by 1984, this gentleman showed up in the Grasshopper Field School camp where I was working, Ray Johnson, um, FBI agent, looking for help from an archeologist to, to go and work on a uh, potential felony crime. And we were keen on this and he was especially keen on it because it, a helicopter was being used to reconnoiter sites and ARPA includes explicit provisions for forfeiture of equipment or supplies used in ARPA cases. And Ray, by God, wanted him a helicopter. <laughs> and so he had proper um, enthusiasm for it. But it was a big deal for many, many years for archeologists to learn how to do damage assessments, to learn the protocols for working with law enforcement, to get busy on ARPA damage assessments and to make it possible. And cases were made all over the country, including a number of fairly high profile ones in Arizona, including this one, which I had a small piece of, where two Yavapai County Sheriff's deputies, uh, Tony Masher and John Price, 
were apprehended both on the Fort Apache Reservation and on the Coconino National Forest. They pled out with the, the uh, U.S. attorneys and ended up only being charged for the crimes that they committed on the forest lands. And so the tribe got a little short shrifted on that. But the main thing is that they got put away. And these guys showed a little bit about the ways that ARPA had changed in the years from 1979 until this case was made in about 2001. Because look at these guys, they're in camo gear. They've got automatic or semi-automatic weapons. They also had federal firearms charges against them. They were very serious about what they were doing. They used archeological reports to identify rooms inside of sites that had not been dug professionally so that they could go and easily identify those rooms and dig those. Um, they worked at night. Um, they uh, left almost no traces. They just got busted by an NAU graduate student, basically, is the way it all ended up. That was the first place that they actually had some trail on this guy. And they led him back to the Fort Apache Reservation. We did some other work that made it possible to, to guarantee that they were going to be convicted. Um, so changing type of MO and ways of doing business as a looters through the, the years. Another illustration of the fact that, you know, very often, especially federal criminal laws, tend to really just drive folks further into the gray zone rather than and to uh, make it so that honest people are less likely to step outside of the lines, whereas truly dishonest people get more and more set in their ways in many ways. And that was the, uh, an example of that. You can also see the swastika that they had carved on the tree above themselves there. So uh, cheery folks um, to interact with, but um, uh, you know, became a little bit of a lesson as well in law enforcement, um, looking over at Dan there and the changes uh, in federal law enforcement through the, t the 2000s and until recently in the Park Service and the BLM and, and in the Bureau of Indian Affairs law enforcement ranks as well, where you had to be a lot more careful. Used to be rangers barely even had weapons. Um, some of them preferred not to carry them. No more. Big difference in the ways that um, these things have changed. So, And so, and then uh, um, because we've been talking a lot about the Hushkow in my house right now, here's Earl Shumway, a, a hardened looter on his way to that Hooskow as a result of crimes in and around the Bears Ears areas. But his, his initials are carved into cliff dwellings on the Fort Apache Indian Reservation as well. So the guy got around. So uh, effectively a subculture class of, um, of looters that were operating there. No more, no more nice guys, no more um, quaint uh, antiquarian collecting at sites. So yes. Uh, things were changing, and uh, it seemed as if, through my years working as the Tribal Historic Preservation Ar Officer and archaeologist for the White Mountain Apache Tribe um, from 1993 until 2005, that because we made some cases, um, because we had some high-profile publicity, um, because the tribal rangers were on duty, because of a number of other factors, it just didn't seem like looting was that big of a deal anymore. I wasn't seeing it showing up anything like it had in the 80s and earliest part of the 1990s. And we all sort of took a breath and relaxed a little bit. And to be honest with you, I thought when I left in 2005 that it was mostly something in the rearview mirror. And so I was happy to leave it to Mark Altaha on uh, your right and Nick Lalek, uh, his deputy historic preservation officer for White Mountain, uh, leave it to them to continue to manage and take care of the place. Younger, smarter, not, still not as good looking, but, <laughs> but, um, but nicer guys in any case um, doing that business there. Well, I was wrong, wrong, wrong. Everything except the better looking part anyway. Um, there was another substantial wave and has been continuing a substantial wave of very serious looting and grave robbing on that jurisdiction and on many other tribal jurisdictions. We're not sure exactly why it is that they're targeting tribal lands, um, but that they are doing. So places, um, sites around the Kanishba cluster uh, that some of you are familiar with, um, sites in the Forestdale Valley that some of you are familiar with, um, and some of the very most remote cliff dwellings have been fairly recently damaged and pretty seriously damaged by looters. Here's, here's a cliff dwelling site on the southwest um, edge of the Fort Apache Reservation that not even Amal Howery found. And it's a pretty good sized site. 
but the looters found it sometime between the time I recorded it in 1999 and 2007 when I went back to it. And they really did a number on it. So I'm gonna spare you the you know, photographs of terrible human remains scattered around the ground. I'll tell you that they, that they were using um, children, almost certainly, in order to crawl into small burial crypts, meaning that they had to go over human remains in order to retrieve pottery and pull it out of the, out of the, 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 the tunnels that they had dug for the, for the kids to be able to get in there. Um, gruesome activities and very, very sophisticated and um, I don't know what else to call it, but rapacious and just nasty business involved in by these guys. So um, the result of that and really the rationale behind it is thousands of pots like this, um, White Mountain Red Wares um, and Salado Polychromes removed from the area on and around the Fort Apache Reservation and put into the international art market. This is actually a Sotheby's catalog pages from like, I think around maybe 1998 or something like that, maybe a little bit earlier. So the, the values have, have gone up two or three or four times since then. We're talking about real money for the main targets of some of these, looter, of these looters. So these are from the 1300s and the early part of the 1400s pots. They are mainly found in burial contexts, especially the whole ones. So it involves, you know, sort of treble damages. The, the ancestors lose out, the contemporary communities lose out, the archaeologists lose out, the communities lose out because you have criminal elements operating in their ranks. And so it's a, it's a, it's a no-win crime. People sometimes think of it as a victimless crime, especially on Indian reservations. It's anything except a victimless crime. And so it also ties in here with, you know, this idea of a global nexus of criminality involved in the international art market, where the same skyrocketing values associated with cultural artifacts and looted goods are circulating in similar ways with guns, um, with weapons, and sometimes with human slaves. Uh, weapons, drugs, not guns and weapons, drugs, guns, and human uh, trafficking all through this increasingly black market. Um, so raising uh, uh, concerns with raising values and increasing the danger levels for the folks that are associated with it and with um, uh, those who would stand up to it. So um, this is just a diagram to show based on really excellent reporting that has come as a result of the investigation of the uh, now defunct, uh, uh, inshallah, uh, Islamic State, the ways that uh, these goods travel through art markets in order to reach um, consumers and um, some of the ways that things get marked up and the values get escalated because of the measures that must be taken in order to guarantee the um, safety of these objects, sometimes making it so that they have to be stored for many years um, and not allowed out so that things can sort of quiet down associated with them. That adds cost um, and um, adds, adds price to them. So a bunch of ways where these things are funneling into North America, Europe, and the Far East um, and making it so that the market for tr looting on places like the Fort Apache Indian Reservation remains a viable way of, for at least for some people, making a living. And archeologists have responded. It's not as if we have been doing nothing. Uh, law enforcement on the international level is very, very serious about understanding looting activities. There was just a talk by uh, Bonnie Magnus Gardner up in Phoenix a couple of nights ago. She was the uh, art crimes lead investigator for the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs and is an archaeologist and is actually going to be at the Society for American Archaeology in, in, uh, in just a few days um, participating in a session on, on, on these topics. Um, but individual archaeologists have now gotten serious about understanding a great deal more about the way that art markets work, about the cultures associated with looting, and again about their connections with um, with gun, drug, and human trafficking. And that is adding profile and dimension for criminologists and law enforcement folks to use to better understand the way that this is all coming together. So, but it has not translated so far into changes 
in the ways that looting is being dealt with on federal and Indian lands in the United States of America. And so about two years ago, we started thinking that there needed to be a better way. What are we gonna do in order to build the toolkit, um, make it more robust and more appropriate to dealing with the new types and levels of looting that we are, are, are contending with here. And so uh, that's my idea of a toolkit. And it's got the top shelf, like the, the, the top tier stuff, like get them on federal felony charges as a result of the standard way of doing business by hoping that an archeologist notices um, uh, looting in time for there to be a suspect involved or hoping a land manager or somebody else comes across a, uh, somebody that should not be operating in the back country, um, usually by trespass or whatever, um, and relying on that. Um, but to be honest with you, the prosecutions have fallen off. Uh, assistant U.S. attorneys have gotten interested in other matters, higher profile um, issues for them to contend with, and are constantly changing and constantly being reprioritized for political reasons, um, set of uh, cases that they have to decide whether or not to go after or not. Um, archaeologists in the federal workforce have also been uh, realigned with other priorities from the administration. And it's not just the current administration. This has been going on for, for more than a decade now, where the focus for the federal workforce is not really on preservation and stewardship. It's much more closely focused on you know, enabling um, activities on public and Indian lands, um, you know, housing, infrastructure, um, and economic development activities. Um, and so the question we wanted to contend with was, well, what are we gonna do? If it's not a high profile in the federal realm anymore, maybe it's time to grow up a little bit and realize that the federal government isn't gonna actually solve all of our problems. I know it's shocking to think that that's true, but it was a little bit of a revelation for me. As Bill mentioned, I really started my professional career working for federal agencies, seeing the amazing power of good that the federal government can do, and um, also seeing how changing federal priorities can have dramatic effects on the ground including this issue of looting. And so um, who's going to step into that breach? And if not archeologists in partnership with tribe, the tribes, then who? Uh, and so we decided to actually take this for a little bit of a test drive and see what we could do with it. And we have had some success in um, trying to understand some new approaches. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about those now, but the little funny bubble diagram on there and the other tool chest drawers, toolkit drawers there, show that there's a number of different things that can be done besides just taking the basic law enforcement approach. So the other revelation from the conversations that we started two years ago is that the one place where we knew we would probably be able to get at least a little bit of traction was by focusing on the one thing that archeologists care lots about and know lots about, dirt. It hasn't been used previously to full effect um, to really understand archeological resource crime or as a tool for prosecution. And so anybody that sees cop shows these days knows that the range of different analytic techniques that are out there in order to be able to pin perpetrators and their equipment, tools, footwear, fingernails, you know, whatever you got back to crime scenes has uh, increased geometrically. The cost has gone down. The precision of these analytic techniques has gone way up. And so that was our first idea. Let's get science involved. And so that led us to uh, you know, come up with this idea of a forensic sedimentology workshop and to host it at the tribal community of Fort Apache, the, 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 you know, one of the auxiliary communities associated with the White Mountain Apache tribe. So we decided to do that and we found some money from the Winterground Foundation and assembled folks, gee whiz, just this past October in order to get that workshop idea off and running and to see how far the forensic sedimentology notion would carry us. And so this is a, 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 doc, a um, diagram here or a figure just to remind us of all the complexity that goes into dirt inside of an archeological site. And then my little table, just to suggest that there's, you know, plant, animal, and mineral components of the dirt in archeological sites. 
They make makes making archaeological sites into incredible compendia of environmental information as well as information about human behavior and giving every archaeological site a distinctive signature in its sedimentology that at least makes it possible to think that if there are sediments adhering to a person, their foot gear, um, their hands, their clothes, the uh, uh, tools that they use, the tire tracks that they, uh, you know, uh, the tires that they drive away from a site in, whatever, that we should be able to provide some assistance in this regard. And so that was the rallying cry that got us the money and got a bunch of people assembled at Fort Apache, is let's look, take a close look at the science part. And so in order to do that, we had to get people together. And we um, decided, like good archeologists, that we would figure out what types of people that we needed to do it. So we have a typology of all of our, of our colleagues here and the names associated with them. And so we knew that we were gonna need community representatives and folks that had special insights into the ways that uh, especially Apache people think since we were working first and foremost on, um, in Apache country. And so we attracted um, native colleagues to join us at Fort Apache. And then we needed to know more about the way that government bureaucrats and criminologists and others think about looting and ways to curb, especially uh, curb looting and curb archeological resource crime. And we knew that we were gonna need folks involved in community advocacy that understand, help us understand the broader range of effects from looting and ways that we could uh, tailor our response to ways that were most meaningful to the folks that were being affected personally um, by the looting activities. And then uh, we needed folks in law enforcement, folks with bad badges or authority as prosecutors to help us understand the um, ways that that community thinks about stuff, the ways that they make their decisions on who's gonna get prosecuted, what constitutes a strong case, what's the difference between archeological evidence and evidence that's admissible in court, these types of questions. Um, everybody was sort of deputized to do some thinking about ways to do public engagement and make the specialized knowledge that they brought to the table accessible to everybody else in the room and especially eventually to um, community members and the public more generally. And then we had a group of people who um, had specialized knowledge in material types, pottery, plant remains, uh, stone artifacts, um, other elements that are important for archeologists um, and for tracing and understanding the full uh, effects of cultural resource crime. Um, we also needed folks connected up with land management organizations and understanding the way that federal land management and tribal land management works. So everybody from the White Mountain Apache tribe chair, uh, Gwendina Lee Realbird, uh, who actually wasn't able to participate much, but to um, the regional archeologist, Gary Cantley, um, and others who had experience with uh, federal agencies in working with tribes. And then kind of at the top of the pyramid, the uber scientists, the folk dealing, folks dealing with isotopes and with um, analytic chemistry to be able to really get into the nitty gritty associated with the sedimentological um, identifications and being able to do the matching work. So that was our crew and here they are basically in the field, um, poking around at one of the fairly recently looted sites at the Fort Apache Reservation. Sarah Hur took this photograph. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Bill, you can see is here. Um, and I wanted to point out a couple of other folks that were super important in the gathering. Um, well, um, Dusty Whiting, who is uh, one of the, the shield bearers there, he's a law enforcement agency. Uh, representative worked with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and also with the White Mountain Apache Tribe for many years. Here's the regional archaeologist, Gary Cantley, who has been instrumental in moving this partnership ahead. You guys know Bill, Barbara Mills, and Karen Adams, familiar to all or most of you. Stacy Ryan is another colleague at Archaeology Southwest, um, who's basically doing most of the work associated with keeping the partnership um, together in many ways. The federal prosecutor here is Randy Green. Um, and, oh, and Mike Richards there, just peeking out over the top. Uh, very important because 
He's the isotope scientist and was my collaborator. And he's the one that said, let's not select these people solely on the basis of their technical expertise and scientific proficiency. Let's select them also on the basis of their collegiality and their ability to work together and across disciplinary boundaries to um, make sense of what we're doing um, and to find ways forward with the information that gets transacted at the workshop. And so that was a great revelation. And it really paid off in terms of the level of cooperation, the level of listening that went on across these otherwise pretty diverse and pretty different groups of people that were involved with our effort. Um, Bill and Mike and I were also keen on making it clear that we weren't se selecting Fort Apache as a venue for the workshop just because I had a long association with the tribe or just because um, it is on a reservation that's been experiencing heavy looting. We selected it because it is a very powerful place in, for reasons incompletely known, we could discuss perhaps at another T, um, but it has been very effective in getting people to pay attention to native points of view for a long time. And so it was a, a way to get um, non-native people's ears to open up in new and different ways, taking them to not just close to the seat of a tribal government, but also taking them to a hub of colonial subjugation, a place where Apache people were brought to heel effectively um, and put uh, under the federal government's control from the time of its uh, uh, establishment in 1871 until 1923, it was a cavalry outpost. And then from there on 1923 until the present, it was a, a Bureau of Indian Affairs funded um, native school. Still is, but of course, without the corporal punishment or funny uniforms or marching around on the parade ground for the students these days. Um, but those colonial legacies and the level of oppression sort of reverberates at the place. And Apache people are attentive to that and it seems to have the effect also on non-Apaches when they visit it, to listen and learn in new and, and different ways. So we actually met right in the commanding officers building, the, 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 the peaked roof thing with the sort of panopticon uh, uh, feature on top of it for the, for the, the workshop. And um, suffice it to say that Fort Apache had its desired effect in many ways um, because it allowed for clarity to come after a few days of deliberations and close engagement with colleagues um, about this way of tribes being disproportionately affected. And so I think I can speak for all or most of the participants in the, in the workshop that we appreciated that um, from the native point of view, looking out on damaged archeological sites and landscapes, um, they see landscapes of, of broken promises from the federal government to take care of them, to take care of their land, and especially even from archeologists and anthropologists that said, oh yeah, we wanna have a long-term relationship with you. We wanna come and study um, your, your customs and your sites, um, but we're here for you. They haven't really seen a lot of follow-up from archeologists um, sticking with the communities and making sure to make good on those, uh, on those pledges. Um, the other thing from a native point of view is a sense of their own stewardship duties being truncated or prohibited, that they feel very, very seriously, uh, and it's culturally ingrained, in fact, for them to take care of sites and lands and landscapes. And having um, the government not do it and make it so that they couldn't do it effectively has been traumatic and, and debilitating for them. Um, then there's this matter of criminal elements operating and being invited into and, and circulating through communities that didn't used to necessarily have to deal with these types of problems of drugs, guns, and other trafficking activities um, and elements of their, their communities uh, co-opted by these, these criminals. The fourth thing listed here is inattention to and disrespect to the knowledge associated with sites and landscapes from native points of view, that archeologists, many 
times, not always, uh, did not pay attention to what Native people had to say about the sites and landscapes themselves, and instead preferred to use scientific methods uh, and learn everything they could to the exclusion of those Native points of view. Uh, and that was also uh, debilitating and harmful for Native people. And of course, then there's this simple matter of having families and ancestors' graves um, disturbed and desecrated. So this is obviously hard information um, for us even to transact. It's uncomfortable to talk about these things. It makes me um, feel sad. Uh, it makes me um, uh, worry a little bit about the tribal communities, especially. Um, and it's important to note, though, that these are just my impressions of it, that this isn't necessarily coming from an Apache or a Hopi point of view. And so there are other uh, effects here that uh, are not possible for me to talk about uh, because I don't know it and I haven't felt my way through all of these things. Um, but it is uh, certainly a source of great trauma and reverberating trauma. And um, frankly, in many instances, it's also a short source of shame because of the inability of these communities to take care of these places, they too feel very badly about this. So, um, so what then would we do with this information other than try to find ways to harness our indignation, our sense of harm and violation, um, our concern for the future of these sites and landscapes, and maybe a bit like Achilles finding ways to recognize that the thing that is our greatest weakness is also the source of the greatest strength associated with, with, um, with tribal communities. And so what do we do other than try to harness these bad things, these disproportional effects and turn them into comparative advantages? And when that happens, it's actually kind of amazing that tribes actually control huge assets and advantages that do not exist in other communities to deal with this problem of looting and desecration. What we found out at the workshop, down to a person, everybody that attended it, really does want to help and was absolutely free and liberal in the provision of assistance, technical assistance, ongoing collaboration in order to keep this initiative alive and moving forward. People have just been great in showing up and continuing to show up to help with the initiative on White Mountain Apache um, lands. That, um, these stewardship uh, duties and ethics that are culturally ingrained in tribal communities are fairly easily awakened. That they have maybe been threatened and subdued, but they are nonetheless alive and well and ready to take hold again. Um, tribes have another unique advantage in the fact that they are unusual legal entities. There are places where effectively they are private landowners and act as private landowners as many ways and have, disc have um, jurisdiction over people that are trespassing on their lands. And they also have federal laws in place. So all tribes have laws against people coming onto their lands, taking stuff, messing around with stuff. And that puts um, criminals in uh, greater peril and exposes them to combinations of civil and criminal prosecutions that don't exist on purely federal jurisdictions. Tribes have also learned the, the sad lesson I mentioned earlier, which is that uh, the federal government is not there to solve all of their problems and never will be. Uh, that they have now built capacities and institutions in many places, including at White Mountain, through their tribal historic preservation offices and cultural preservation offices to take care of the cultural resources and the things that they hold the dearest themselves. Um, tribal rangers are the other sort of ace in a hole here. Tribes, uh, thanks to lawsuits from the Mescalero tribe as well as from the White Mountain Apache tribe in the late 1960s, have jurisdiction over their fish and game. And so they, not the states, sell fish and game, fishing and hunting permits. And they have the proceeds from that. And from those proceeds, they hire rangers. And those rangers patrol lands and have federal as well as tribal law enforcement authority. And so they also typically have cultural knowledge, um, special backcountry knowledge of the locations of sites and are very often times excellent law enforcement uh, rangers, uh, officers that you don't want on your trail. 
Um, and tribes have sovereignty over their land, limited though it may be. They have an enormous amount of control over what happens there, how it happens, with whom things can proceed, and are excellent partners for the type of uh, experiment that we've now got going there. So the tribe has bought in to this experiment, uh, bought into this notion of harnessing this range of values, um, is eager to see us proceed. And so proceed we are um, to move away from this state-based, several central government, uh, expert-driven approach to dealing with site preservation from and protection from looting um, toward a more context-specific set of tools for um, addressing the problems, getting away from using hammers on, on, uh, on bolts and wrenches on nails towards um, something at least that we think looks a little bit like this. It's got some cyclicity to it, involves very much like the archeology span Southwest graphic combinations of outreach, of research, and of uh, public engagement and um, preservation activities. Um, those three key components that involves starting off with identifying what the, who the partners are. As I mentioned, White Mountain is all in. Then it comes the time that we're still involved with, um, doing some more deeper listening, figuring out exactly what the issues and concerns are associated with looting and what the tribe would like to see done as a result of that. Moving from the listening into the preparing. Uh, this is all sort of going on more or less at, as we speak, where we are bringing together the best available training information and encoding that in a uh, damage assessment guide um, to be used and using that as the basis also for intensive site rec recording as the basis for surveillance so that we can detect changes in, the, in sites and landscapes as a result of looting activity and criminal activity. And then that's preparing us to be able to be more responsive, to have a ranger core and um, specialized criminal investigators on call, ready for dispatch effectively to sites, especially ones with uh, warmer trails towards suspects um, to do the incident-based investigations that are very intensive crime scene investigations, especially when you add on this layer of forensic sedimentology. Um, putting to use the historical information that is accumulating from compiling damage assessments from White Mountain and related jurisdictions to learn more about looter um, modus operandi and other aspects of uh, nefarious activities that might help us figure out better ways to respond. Um, and then sharing the kind of thing that we're doing right now that, that we'll be doing at the uh, Society for American Archaeology meetings next week and at the Arizona Preservation Conference in June and in ongoing conversations with tribal colleagues uh, from other jurisdictions. And then a part that's been left out really is this healing and remediation dimension that we hope will allow people to recognize that and appreciate the range of harms that have occurred and to come up with ways that we can address those harms together. Uh, that archeologists have participated in the harms, not necessarily directly, but by maybe, maybe by failing to always be there to, to um, help with um, this problem on tribal lands and to recognize that the, the physical sites sometimes need to be taken care of to keep them from eroding further and uh, being further damaged as a result of, of, uh, of reckless excavations, um, but that the communities and the individuals are also affected by it. Um, and then back into partnering. So if this works, then um, we'll be able to uh, hopefully move forward. And if uh, uh, all continues to go apace, we'll be in the very near future developing an integrated media campaign strategy to focus specifically on White Mountain Apache tribe and adjacent, adjacent communities, the places where those White Mountain Redwares you know, came from predominantly, that will um, you know, use the key media um, outlets that exist on uh, White Mountain Apache tribe lands, which is the radio and Facebook, uh, and, and, and conversations outside the grocery stores. And everything else is just not very important on White Mountain Apache tribe lands. So we need to, to work backwards from the key media and identifying the messages that are gonna be the most effective to enlist public support and engagement 
in curbing this archaeological resource crime, um, continuing to do the, uh, the, um, the listening that I mentioned earlier so that we can do a better job of being partners, um, continuing to empower the rangers like Louis Zospa there on the right, um, and continuing also to harness the first thing that I learned from my colleagues, believe it or not, that's me sitting in the front of, uh, of, of folks. I don't know what this is. We don't even know exactly when this happened. It was so long ago. Uh, beyond archaeological uh, recognition there somewhere. Uh, maybe sometime like 1986, though. But one of the first things that these guys all taught me, and probably the most important lesson, is how much they care about these lands and these places, and how much distaste they have for people that refuse to respect their lands and their sites and their ancestors. Um, and so if we can continue to uh, encourage build capacity locally, and move forward in that type of a partnership, we feel pretty certain that we're gonna be successful. And we know we'll be successful if we can count on your continued help and um, also on your comments, critiques, and questions from the presentation from this afternoon. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Me. Are we reaching beyond the Apache? What we're thinking is that if it works there, then we can adapt it elsewhere. But we want to find an all-in partner to start an intensive campaign and really sort of, I don't know what else to say, but use every single tool we can come up with in one jurisdiction to see whether or not that can actually matter and to actually be deliberate about doing it so that we can measure the effects of our activity. So Friday, I went to uh, an Agnes Howery Foundation workshop and they um, are gonna be given the opportunity to help us design that mechanism for monitoring um, people's responses to the campaign to come up with other ways to see whether or not um, media outreach, intensive engagement, all of the intensive surveillance, um, the intensive damage assessment and site condition work that we'll do will have a measurable effect. And we think that'll give us a better chance to either invite other partners or to modify the program to make it more appropriate. We thought it was not a good idea to go too far, too fast beyond Apache country, because every tribal jurisdiction, every tribal community is so different from one another. And they all need specialized attention from our point of view. So, you know, there's kind of just, you know, whatever, 15% of me and maybe 80% of Stacy at Archaeology Southwest available to do this. And Stacy has, you know, pan BIA um, responsibilities and then some sometimes. And so we don't wanna to get too, what should we say, diffuse or distracted. We wanna see what full engagement, kind of a saturation thing looks like. Um, because the, the broad, you know, big brother is watching, the federal government says no, um, hasn't worked. We wanna see what happens when we go from the ground up. I don't know if it's a good idea or not. We're gonna to try to find out though. Hopi would be, a great next stop, as would San Carlos, because the idea would be to maybe see if it worked a little bit in that area, then you just start off and kind of spread out from there and see whether or not can capture um, other tribal jurisdictions and completely exclude looting and archeological resource crime from those other jurisdictions. That's the goal. John, could you just comment the ceramics that you were showing were obviously ancestral Puebloan uh, ceramics back there at the beginning. What is the um, sort of pers Apache perspective on those kinds of resources on the White Mountain Reservation? So this is um, ties in with my comments about the sort of sense of stewardship duty that many Native people uh, feel, but Apaches feel very keenly. And so under Apache jurisdiction, 
ancestral Pueblo sites, and there are thousands of them on Apache lands, ancestral Hopi and Zuni sites on both San Carlos and White Mountain Apache tribe lands. Um, they suffered not at all. They were left almost completely intact. Apaches helped themselves to groundstone, to some chipstone, uh, groundstone monos and matates, to some chipstone, and to other surface goods. But one of the first lessons that young Apaches learned was that unless somebody gives you something, you leave it alone. And especially something that is encountered out and about in the land was left there for a reason. And unless you know exactly what that reason is, and you're prepared to answer the questions with, I don't know what else to say, the powers that be about why you are touching it, using it without permission and without authorization, without frankly proper protection from the people that left it there, then you're taking not only your own life into your hands, but the lives of all of your family, your entire clan, and everybody that you might come into contact with. And Apaches hold that much of the reason for the disruption in the world at large and for the ill health and spiritual crisis in their own communities and around the planet stems from exactly the sort of disrespect demonstrated by looters. That only profound and sustained respect for one another, and most especially for those that have come before us, holds true evil at bay. And so they take it seriously. And they are very nervous um, with the idea of people entering onto their lands and looting these things, not simply because of their duties to take care of archeological sites and even because of the criminal element operating in their communities, but literally because of the hell unleashed from this type of disrespect. Just in case not anybody could hear that, the question is um, in part because of the stewardship ethic for Apaches and for other native communities, when and if um, artifacts or other looted items are recovered, are they returned to the tribes? And the answer is yes, um, but it provides for the restoration um, and remediation of the sites and um, allows for the assessment uh, of the penalty, the, the, the dollar cost associated with that um, onto the perpetrator, onto the convicted person. And so you very frequently have very high um, um, fines, penalties, monetary penalties levied on, on violators of the Archaeological Resources Protection Act. And so that includes also some of the spiritual treatments that have been done um, in order to try to create the beginning, at least, of the healing, to apologize to all the affected parties for this level of disrespect, um, ask forgiveness, and allow the community process to proceed. So it's a fine question. Thank you. Yes, Anne. Um, it seems that Sotheby's and other auction houses are part of the problem. And so what, what is their role in this, stemming, leading? Yeah, I think that's the um, literally um, billion dollar a year question. Um, probably even more than that, but that's the stuff that we know about. And so, <clears throat> at least from my vantage, um, without you know willing sellers and willing buyers at the end of the value chain, uh, uh, you know none of this really happens. A lot of it goes away, and so um, they are implicated. They have found very sophisticated ways to protect themselves and shield themselves from legal scrutiny. Um, the best of them, and Sotheby's is one of them, um, does do quite a bit of diligence in order to try to stay away from antiquities or other art market stuff that have been illegally removed from their, their context, whether or not they're um, you know, domestic or international contexts. 
But a couple of things have happened in recent years. One is the rise of, um, of professional authenticators, in part because of this diligence on the part of the auction houses. And so there are now people, and you can go to their websites and see, and some of them are very, appear to be very reputable individuals. And some of them, for all I know, really are fully reputable. But they will do the entire chain of ownership, uh, um, investigation, and either verify or deny that the claims of the seller are, are true and that it is a, a bona fide transactable piece of, of art. Um, there's a second ethical question about whether or not it, it's a good idea for humanity to transact in these kinds of things. And I'm afraid I don't have the answer to that. I'm focused right now, at least on the illegal stuff. The other thing that the, the looters, at least in Arizona and adjacent states have done, and I'm not sure how big of a problem it is in other parts of the world, but they will recruit adjacent private landowners to say there's a private landowner uh, 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 close to the Fort Apache Indian Reservation, White Mountain Apache tribe lands. And so they'll recruit them and pay them in order to say, oh yeah, we dug this stuff up off of my private land. And so they'll include them in the um, you know, partnership of, of, of trafficking in order to create a um, plausible deniability associated with it. Please. So a lot of the innovations have been scaled way back by you know, forfeiture or straight up stealing. So where, it's, where it is private property and where these artifacts are found, is there any protection afforded to the tribes given that they're their property on property that's been taken from them? Um, probably only on that ethical, spiritual level, I'm afraid. There's, uh, you know, private property in the United States of America still is the supreme rule of the land. Um, so barring that, there is very little that can be done. There are protections for graves in some states, right? And it's still not legal to intentionally excavate human remains without a prompt, without a permit. Um, but the objects associated with it um, are usually overlooked by state authorities and laws. I, any other folks could comment on that, that no state better, state law better than I do um, for Arizona and other places. I've spent so much of my time so closely focused on federal jurisdictions and Indian jurisdictions that I do not know the state authorities well and the things that pertain on private lands. Yes, Ken. Well, isn't it fair to say, though, that Archaeology Southwest is one, I, I, I hope it's not the only one, but one of the few that will actually go out to private landowners and give them the benefit of helping them protect or know that they have, a, have some valuable, um, you know, Indian antiquity and either pay to manage it themselves or pay the owner to let them come in and assess it and I don't I mean that's one of the only ways I would think is first education and then actually come in and help them by what adopting the site or whatever you say or getting a, a, a legal right to the site so it's protected I, mean, I think that's one of the things that gave us such a, a strong affinity to the work that I mean, we, we're now learning a lot more but the great work that's going on by Archaeology Southwest, or they're out there on the ground protecting it, which not very many groups are out there to do that. So, at least one little, one little positive, and hopefully not too bleak, but it's, it's kind of a sad story. It's kind of a sad story, and it's a little tough, but you know, on the other hand, um, if we don't start attending to it, it's probably not going to get any better. Um, this particular story. No, that's that's exactly right. And so um, I didn't do as good a job as I should have by by mentioning that that was the focus for that main part of the site protection program, this idea of acquiring lands or acquiring conservation easements for lands where you have a landowner that wants to see a place protected into perpetuity, um, surrendering the development rights, the rights to alter or sell the land in a way that's gonna be, you know, commercially developed or, or changed significantly uh, enough to alter the archeological resources, then you have the conservation easement option. And it's 
something that we're pretty good at. So, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for. My pleasure. Thank you.